Japhethite, Aryan, Europoid, Caucasian. There have been many terms used for what those in the English-speaking world would refer to as white or European people, and the term race already has a devious enough connotation for some people and may incite certain emotions due to historical context, but throughout history and in the present day, it seems that there has been a heavy debate for political or research purposes on just what constitutes the European race. Some have even gone so far as to say that the concept of the white race is a myth or social construct, which I suppose if you're judging purely by appearance, then you'd be correct. But in today's video, we're going to look over the genetic origins of people of the European continent to see their divisions and connections with other group of people. One of the most widely used terms, Caucasian, is rather odd considering that the average inhabitant native to the Caucasian region, such as Georgians, Armenians, or Azeris, definitely are not what people think of the general European to look like. Not to mention that the Indo-Europeans most likely originated in the steppes of Eurasia in modern Russia rather than the Caucasus as was previously assumed. In the United States and other Anglophone countries, for a long time in their histories, it was brought into question just who was a part of the Caucasian race and therefore admissible as immigrants, and at various points in time, Slavs, Italians, Greeks, Turks, Arabs, Indians, and Mestizos from Latin America debated whether they should be considered Caucasian or not, and in the present day, the United States Census Bureau considers all those with origins from Europe, Caucasus, the Middle East, Central Asia, and North Africa to be white, except Spain, which makes absolutely no sense. Even in the United Kingdom, the British police divide Caucasians between what they officially call IC1, North Europeans, who in this context are mostly native Brits or immigrants from Poland and Lithuania, and other Caucasians classified as IC2, Mediterranean which includes immigrants from Southern Europe, such as Greeks, Italians, Spaniards, and Southern Frenchmen, with some minor overlap with Middle Eastern and North African populations as well, and this is based purely off appearance for convenience sake. But why is there a difference in appearance between Europeans from different areas if they really are descended from a single unique source? Well, I'm sure as you could guess, it's because Europeans are not, in fact, a single population grouping, but have a plethora of different admixture sources in their gene pool, similar to almost every other large ancestral continuum, and this is due to many waves of migration into and in between areas of the continent, and divergent evolution that gave rise to different genotypes and phenotypes. Similar to most other areas of Eurasia, the original inhabitants of Europe were not anatomically modern humans, but rather various groups of Neanderthal, the distant cousin of Homo sapiens, and although many Europeans tend to pride themselves on their high levels of Neanderthal DNA, and others disparage them for it, it actually turns out that East Asians have the highest degree of Neanderthal admixture, although both populations have been influenced in quite interesting ways by their archaic cousins and inhabited their homelands hundreds of thousands of years before them. The modern people of Europe are actually descended from three major archaic groups, as can be ascertained by archaeogenetic analysis, that being the indigenous European hunter-gatherers who date back many tens of thousands of years, although really you can also divide these between Eastern and Western European groupings, Neolithic Anatolian farmers who, as their name implies, arrived in the area from Anatolia around the Neolithic Revolution around 7000 BC, and lastly, the Indo-European speaking steppe pastoralists around 3000 BC, who brought with them the wheel and many other innovations, including their language, and another branch, the Proto-Indo-Iranian or Aryan component, instead headed southeast into Iran and the Indian subcontinent. By cross-referencing with ancient genetic samples, we are able to see just how these archaic ancestral populations interacted and created the modern people groups we see today, and there's a surprising amount of overlap between various groups, and just like the Amerindians, despite diverse origins, each ancestry has penetrated all regions of the continent due to generations of intense intermixing. The Neolithic Anatolian farmers intermixed with the archaic hunter-gatherers and penetrated all regions of the continent, but especially the southern regions around the Mediterranean, but is most heavily preserved in the population of the island of Sardinia today, who despite their central position in arguably the most important body of water in all of human history, have remained relatively untouched by outside migration from either Italy, Europe, or other areas.
This ancestry is also likely the reason for the basal morphological differences between northern and southern Europe, with the more southern phenotype, often described as Mediterranean, being closer to that of the Near East in both facial features, skin color, and body type than those in northern Europe. The steppe pastoralist or Yamnaya ancestry that entered Europe clearly had the biggest impact on the northern and eastern regions with the Proto-Indo-Europeans being rich in ancient North Eurasian ancestry found in Siberian and paleo amerindian populations and later entering the Caucasus and Middle East as well. This steppe pastoralist component is today highest in Scandinavia, northeastern Europe, and around the North Sea region, although again penetrated virtually the entire continent in varying amounts, and I ironically is even found at some of the highest rates among the Volga Euro region in the Udmurts, Tatars, and Chuvash, all of whom were formerly Indo-European speaking before the migration of Eastern Eurasian Euralians and Turks. Again, these differences in ancestry in the continent have likely contributed to the differences in phenotype and genetics between those in the north and south, as well as some phenotypic gradation between east and west as well, becoming more correlated with modern ethnolinguistic groups in the present day due to endogamy and migration. Additionally, principal component analysis charts of genetic clustering among Western Eurasian populations usually show a spectrum with Northern Europeans at one end and Middle Easterners at the other, with Southern European groups being in between these two, while the Caucasus definitely seems to cluster more heavily with the Middle Eastern Klein. Even non-Indo-European speaking groups like the Hungarians still display a high genetic affinity to their neighbors in Europe despite their supposed foreign origins, showing that most groups have retained their genetic base since this time period of intermixing roughly four to 9,000 years ago, with the migration of the Indo-Europeans being the last major migration to shape the continent, bringing with them haplogroup R1b and R1a, with the latter now found at its highest rates in Eastern Europe and Northern India due to the migration of the proto Indo-Iranians, but should the Aryans really be considered European? Well, that's a very loaded and politically charged subject due to the legacy of colonialism in the subcontinent, but as I mentioned in a previous video, the old steppe Indo-Europeans of Central Asia were indeed quite close in both genetics and phenotype to ancient Europeans, albeit with heavy Middle Eastern and minor Eastern Eurasian admixture. Over time, these different groups in the European continent would gradually become their own distinct gene pool, and the fact that Europeans had a much higher rate of interregional migration and intermixing than many other areas of the world further strengthened this genetic clustering. Due to these high rates of intermixing in the past few thousand years, Europeans generally do not have the same vast regional genetic disparities as, say, Africans, who are very clearly and easily divisible by Nilotic, Pygmy, Khoisan, and West African components at the very least because of surface-level traits. There's also the issue of the Ashkenazi Jews and Romani, two groups that have lived in the European continent for over a thousand years, but they originate from the Levant and Northern India respectively. The Ashkenazi component you usually see in genetic testing companies like 23andMe is actually a combination of ancient Semitic and European DNA, while the Romani are more of a combination of low-caste northern Indo-Aryans with a substantial amount of Middle Eastern admixture, but similar to the Ashkenazi have large and varying levels of European DNA, with many Jews and Romani actually being indistinguishable from the native population, although due to generations of endogamy and drift are easily recognizable genetically. Creating a map of European DNA worldwide would be quite difficult, especially in the periphery regions, as for instance, even though at least 10% of the gene pool of the Maghrebi countries of Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia can be traced back to migrants from Europe within the past 2,000 years, with these genetic testing companies, those from this region usually only display a North African ancestry as they control for this admixture, which has become heavily entrenched in the local population. Additionally, groups like the Anatolian Turks, Central Asians, and Indo-Aryans also share ancestry with Europeans, but almost certainly wouldn't consider themselves to be part European. So for my map on European ancestry worldwide, I decided to go only by self-identification rather than genetic admixture. As you can see, interestingly, patterns of European migration and settlement are almost exclusively north of the Tropic of Cancer and south of the Tropic of Capricorn. Basically, just anywhere except the tropics, for obvious reasons.
Different groups of Europeans in the diaspora may have varying rates of admixture from entirely different racial groups, most notably in Latin America, where the number of full-blooded Europeans is actually quite small, even though the self-identified white or European population is actually higher than that of the United States, believe it or not. The situation in the US, Canada, and Australia is pretty similar in that although a large portion of the European population claims ancestry from the indigenous people, Amerindians and Aborigines respectively, the percentage that actually have any sort of significant native heritage whatsoever is actually quite small, less than 10%. The native or non-white heritage of the South African Afrikaners is much more substantial and widespread than in other English-speaking regions, with around 4-7% to of their genome being of Bantu, Khoi, or South Asian origin on average, although ironically, this is the one area of the planet where they don't actually claim it. So are the Europeans one race? Well, as I discussed in my video over the number of races, when you get past the four major ancestral continuums, racial lines become increasingly arbitrary and up to interpretation, and I think it's a real shame that race and ancestry has become such a politically loaded and sensitive subject. Essentially, European ancestry is actually a measurable and well-studied cluster in population genetics, but white people, just like black people, as a modern global socio-political concept has a much more fluid and ill-defined meaning, which I don't think is too relevant in the current day. So go ahead and let me know your thoughts on the origin and evolution of the Europeans and the interesting dynamics between European groups and other highly disparate populations throughout the world. In the case of myself, of course, my father is European while my mom is Iranian and black American. For today's poll, let me know which group of diaspora Europeans on various continents you'd like to learn more about or have an interest in. And as always, thanks for watching everyone. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.